adding in passing, as it were, the very curious information that this was the first time he had ever hinted at this 75,000, and that even General Yepanchin himself, sitting nearby, didn't know. In a word, nobody knew. Nastasia Filipovna's reply astounded both the friends. There was not the faintest trace of her former sneering manner, her former hostility and hatred, the laughter which sent cold shivers up Totsky's spine at the mere recollection. No, on the contrary, she seemed glad to be able to talk to someone amicably and frankly. She admitted that she herself had wanted to ask for friendly advice for a long time, and only pride had prevented her. Now, since the ice had been broken, nothing could suit her better. Smiling sadly at first, but then gaily breaking out into playful laughter, she confessed that at all events her stormy scenes were a thing of the past. She had long ago changed her view of matters, and though her heart remained unaltered, she had been compelled to accept many things as a fait accompli. What was done could not be undone. What was past was past. She was surprised, even, that Afanasy Ivanovich should still be so fearful. Here she addressed the general and declared, in an attitude of deepest respect, that she had long been hearing a good deal about his daughters and was in the habit of thinking of them with profound and sincere esteem. The very thought that she might be of service to them would be, of course, a source of happiness and pride. It was true that she was depressed and dull at present, exceedingly dull, Afanasy Ivanovich had divined her dreams correctly. She would like to renew herself, if not through love, then through a family, as a new end in life. As to Gavrila Ardalionovich, however, she could say nothing. It was probably true that he loved her. She sensed that she could fall in love herself, if she could be convinced of the firmness of his affections. Still, even if sincere, he was very young. No. It was a hard decision. What pleased her most, incidentally, was that he was employed and toiled to support his entire household. She had heard that he was a man of energy and pride who wanted a career, was anxious to get on. She had also heard that Nina Alexandrovna Ivulgina, his mother, was a splendid and most estimable woman and that his sister, Varvara Ardalionovna, was a very fine and energetic girl. She had heard a good deal about her from Ptitsin. She had also heard that they were bearing up under their misfortunes. She would much like to make their acquaintance, but there was the question of whether they would welcome her into their family. On the whole, she had nothing against the marriage, but it needed careful consideration. She hoped they would not press her. Regarding the 75,000, it was a pity Afanasy Ivanovich had felt it so difficult to mention it. She knew the value of money and would accept it, of course. She was grateful to Afanasy Ivanovich for his tact in not mentioning it even to the general, let alone Gavrila Ardelionovich. Still, why shouldn't he know about it in advance? She had no reason to feel shame about accepting it on coming into their family. At all events, she had no intention of asking anybody's forgiveness for anything, and wished them to know that. She would not marry Gavrila Adalionovich unless she was convinced that neither he nor his family harbored any reservations on her account. In any case, she didn't regard herself as guilty of anything, and it was better that Gavrila Adalionovich knew on what basis she had been living in Petersburg for the last five years what her relationship with Afanasy Ivanovich had been, and whether she had amassed any personal wealth. Finally, if she were accepting money now, it was certainly not as payment for her maidenly shame, in which she was blameless, but simply as a recompense for her ruined life. Towards the end, she had become so ill-tempered and irritable in making all this plain, as was only natural, that General Yepanchin was very pleased and regarded the matter as concluded. The thoroughly unmanned Totsky, however, was mistrustful even now, and long feared to find a snake under these flowers. Nevertheless, the negotiations began. 
The point on which the entire strategy of the two friends was based, namely the possibility of Nastasia Filipovna being attracted to Ganya, had gradually begun to take clearer and more convincing shape, so that even Totsky at times started to believe in the possibility of success. Meanwhile, Nastasia Filipovna had discussed the matter with Ganya. Few words were spoken, as if her modesty found the subject painful. She acknowledged and permitted his love, but insisted that she had complete freedom of action. She reserved the right to say no, right up to the wedding itself, should there be one, even at the very last minute. She allowed absolutely the same right to him. Soon, Ganya learned by chance that Nastasia Filipovna certainly knew the broad details of his family's hostility to the marriage, and to her personally, evidenced by domestic scenes. She never spoke of this to him, though he was in daily expectation of it. It would be possible to mention a great deal else concerning the history and circumstances surrounding this matchmaking and the accompanying negotiations, but we have run on ahead as it is, and in any case, some of the circumstances were no more than the vaguest hearsay. Totsky, for example, was supposed to have found out somewhere that Nastasia Filipovna had entered into some vague, secret relations with the Yepanchin girls, a most improbable story. On the other hand, there was another nightmarish rumor he felt compelled to believe. He heard for a fact that Nastasia Filipovna was perfectly well aware that Ganya was marrying her for money, and that he was a blackguard envious, intolerant, and voracious, a monster of self-regard. That formerly Ganya had indeed passionately sought to conquer Nastasia Filipovna, but when the two friends had made up their minds to exploit this reciprocal passion for their own ends, and buy Ganya by selling him Nastasia Filipovna as his lawful wedded wife, he had conceived a poisonous hatred for her. Passion and hatred seemed strangely intermingled in his heart. And although he agreed in the end, after agonizing hesitations, to marry the awful woman, he swore in his heart to wreak bitter revenge on her for it, and make her smart, as he was supposed to have put it himself. All this Nastasia Filipovna was supposed to be aware of, and she was thought to be hatching something up in secret. Totsky was so unnerved that he had ceased confiding his anxieties to Yepanchin. There were moments, however, when, like any weak man, he took heart again, and his spirits rose quickly. He was immensely cheered, for example, when Nastasia Filipovna finally promised both friends that, on the evening of her birthday, she would make her decision. On the other hand, the oddest and most unlikely rumor of all, which concerned the highly respected Ivan Fyodorovich Yepanchin himself, had turned out, alas, to be more and more probable. At first glance, the whole thing seemed utterly preposterous. It was hard to credit that Ivan Fyodorovich, in his honorable old age, with all his outstanding intelligence and worldly wisdom, and so on and so forth, could be infatuated by Nastasia Filipovna himself, but that was what was being said. Indeed, infatuated to such an extent, the thing seemed almost to border on passion. It was hard to imagine exactly what hopes he entertained in the matter. Perhaps he was even counting on Ganya's cooperation. Totsky was beginning to suspect something of the sort, at least, to suspect the existence of some kind of tacit agreement, almost, between the general and Ganya, based on their mutual understanding of one another. Still, it is well known, of course, that a man carried away by passion, especially at an advanced age, is quite blind, and ready to detect hope where none exists. He loses his reasoning powers, moreover, and acts like some silly child, whatever his intellectual equipment. It was common knowledge that the general was intending to give Nastasia Filipovna a wonderful pearl necklace of enormous value for her birthday, and had taken great trouble over the gift, though he knew that Nastasia Filipovna was not a mercenary woman. On the eve of her birthday, he was almost in a fever, 
though he concealed his feelings adeptly. It was of this same necklace that Madame Yepanchina had heard rumors. Yelizaveta Prokofievna had long experience of her husband's waywardness, was even used to it to some extent, but clearly this was too much to let pass. The pearl rumor vastly intrigued her. The general had got wind of this in good time. There had been words between them the day before, and he foresaw that a thorough explanation of his conduct was inevitable. This was the reason why he was decidedly disinclined to go and have lunch in the bosom of his family on the morning this story began. Even before the arrival of the prince, he had intended to plead pressure of work and avoid doing so. For the general, avoiding things sometimes meant fleeing from the house, pure and simple. He just wanted to get this day over, especially the evening, without unpleasantness. And suddenly, here was the prince's opportune arrival. God must have sent him, thought the general as he went in to his wife. Chapter 5 Madame Yepanchina was jealous of her lineage. Her feelings may well be imagined on learning bluntly and without preparation that this Prince Mishkin, the last of her line and a man of whom she had already heard something, was no more than a pitiable idiot, almost a beggar, accepting alms. The general had been at pains to create an effect which would grip her attention at once and divert it somehow away from him. In moments of crisis, Madame Yepanchina was wont to open her eyes very wide and lean her body back slightly, staring vaguely before her without uttering a word. She was a tall, lean woman of about her husband's age, with abundant dark hair, heavily streaked with gray, a somewhat aquiline nose, sallow, sunken cheeks, and thin, puckered lips. Her forehead was high, if narrow, her gray, rather prominent eyes occasionally held a most surprising expression. At one time, she had been prone to think her glance extremely striking, and the conviction had remained unshakably with her. Receive him? You mean, receive him now, this instant? Here, Madame Yepanchina strove to widen her eyes at the general fidgeting before her. Oh, as far as that goes, one can dispense with the formalities just as long as you wish to see him, my dear. The general hastened to explain. He's an absolute child. One feels so sorry for him. He has fits of some kind. He's back from Switzerland, just off the train, dressed rather oddly, sort of German fashion, and literally not a kopeck to his name, practically in tears. I gave him 25 rubles and want to get him some sort of clerking job in the office. I would ask you, madame, to offer him some lunch, because it appears he's hungry as well. You astonish me, his wife pursued. Hungry and fits? What sort of fits? Oh, they don't happen very often. Besides, he's almost like a child. Educated, though. I would like you, madame, he addressed his daughters again. To put him through an examination. It would be useful to know what he's good for, after all. Examination? Drawled his wife and began rolling her eyes from husband to daughters and back again in profound astonishment. Ah, my dear, don't misunderstand my meaning. Well, as you wish. I meant make a fuss of him and make him feel at home. It's almost an act of charity. Feel at home? From Switzerland? That could come in useful. Still, as I say, just as you wish. I am suggesting this in the first place because he's your namesake, perhaps even a relative, and secondly, because he doesn't know where to lay his head. I had thought it might be of some interest to you, as he bears the name. Of course we should, Mama, if it's informal. Besides, he's hungry after his journey. Why not give him something to eat if he has nowhere to go? Said the eldest, Alexandra. A complete child as well. We could play blind man's buff with him. Blind man's buff? How do you mean? Oh, Mama, please do stop putting on an act, Aglaya cut in, vexed. 
The humorous middle daughter, Adelaida, couldn't help bursting out laughing. Call him in, Papa, Aglaya decided. Mama gives her permission. The general rang for the prince to be summoned. But only on condition he ties a napkin round his neck when he sits down to table, his wife decided. Call Fyodor, or let Mavra, to stand behind him and see to him while he's eating. Is he quiet during these fits at least? Doesn't wave his arms about? On the contrary, he's been very nicely brought up and his manners are beautiful. He's just a trifle too simple sometimes. But here he is. So then, may I introduce Prince Mishkin? Last of his line, your namesake and perhaps relation. Do welcome him and make him feel at home. Lunch is being served, Prince. Do us the honor. You'll excuse me. I'm afraid I'm late. I must dash off. We know where you're dashing off to, said his wife heavily. I'm in a hurry, my dear, and I'm late. I'm late. Do show him your albums, madame, and get him to write something for you. You've never seen such a writer, a real talent. The way he noted down for me out there in old-fashioned lettering, the abbot Paphnutius hath put his hand hereunto. Well then, au revoir. Paphnutius? Abbot? Wait a moment. Wait, where are you off to, and who's this Paphnutius? Cried Madame Yepanchina to her absconding spouse, her dogged expression verging on alarm. It's all right, it's all right, my dear. It was in olden times, an abbot. I'm off to the Count's. He's been expecting me long ago, and the thing is, he fixed the time himself. Au revoir, Prince. The general made off, stepping swiftly. I know, I know, Count indeed, said Yelizaveta Prokofievna brusquely, and transferred her petulant gaze to the Prince. What was I saying just then? She began, tentative and peevish, struggling to bring it to mind. What was it again? Oh, yes. What abbot was that again? Maman, began Alexandra, while Aglaya went so far as to stamp her little foot. Don't interrupt, Alexandra Ivanovna, snapped Madame Yepanchina. I want to know, too. Sit here, Prince. Here in this armchair opposite. No, here towards the sun. Move near the light so I can see you. Well, now, who is this abbot? Abbot Paphnutius, responded the prince, earnestly attentive. Paphnutius? That's interesting. Well, what about him, then? Madame Yepanchina questioned him abruptly, quick and eager, keeping her eyes fixed on him. When the prince replied, she nodded after every word. Abbot Paphnutius lived in the 14th century, the prince began. He was the head of a monastery on the Volga, in present-day Kostoma province. He was well known for his righteous life and used to travel to the Horde to help in the management of affairs in those days. He signed a document, and I've seen a photograph of that signature. I liked the style of writing and learned how to do it. When the general wanted to see my writing just now to decide if I was suitable for employment, I wrote a number of sentences in different scripts. Among them, the abbot Paphnutius hath set his hand hereunto using the handwriting of Abbot Paphnutius himself. The general liked it very much. That's why he recalled it just now. Aglaya, said Madame Yepanchina, remember that, Paphnutius. Better still, write it down. I'm always forgetting things. However, I thought it would be more interesting than that. Where is the signature, then? It's still on the table in the general's study, I think. Send someone to fetch it at once. It might be better if I wrote it for you some other time, if it's more convenient. Of course, Mama, said Alexandra. We should have lunch now. We're hungry. Very well, decided Madame Yepanchina. Let us go, Prince. Are you very hungry? Yes, I do feel hungry now, and I really am most grateful to you. I need I'm very glad answer. you're well-mannered, and I can see you're not at all the eccentric you were made out to be. Come along. Sit yourself here, opposite me. She Not fussed about working. seating the prince when they arrived in the dining room. I want to look at you. Alexandra, Adelaida, look after the prince. He's not at all an invalid, is he? Perhaps we can dispense with the napkin, too. Did they used to tie you a napkin on at mealtimes? 
Formerly, when I was about seven, I think they used to do that. But now I normally put it on my knees when I'm eating. Quite right. And the fits? Fits? The prince was somewhat surprised. I have fits quite rarely these days. I don't know, though. They say the climate here won't be good for me. He speaks very well, remarked Madame Yepanchina, addressing her daughters and continuing to nod after every word of the prince's. I didn't expect that at all. It must have been all stuff and nonsense, as usual. Help yourself, prince, and tell us where you were born and brought up. I want to know everything. You interest me greatly. The prince thanked her and, while eating with great relish, began relating what he had been obliged to repeat several times that morning. Madame Yepanchina's pleasure increased. The girls also listened with a fair amount of interest. They discussed their degree of kinship, and the prince turned out to have a good knowledge of his family tree. However hard they tried, though, it seemed there was hardly any blood relationship between him and Madame Yepanchina at all. There might have been some distant connection among the grandfathers and grandmothers. Madame Yepanchina enjoyed this kind of dry stuff. She got few opportunities of talking about her pedigree, however much she wanted to, and rose from the table much elated. Let's all go to our sitting room, she said, and they'll bring the coffee in there. We have this little common room, she told the prince as she let him out. Just my little drawing room where we sit together when we're on our own and everybody gets on with their own work. Alexandra here, my eldest daughter, plays the piano, reads or sews. Adelaida paints landscapes or portraits and never finishes anything. And Aglaya just sits and does nothing. I'm all thumbs as well. Can't get anything done. Well now, here we are. Sit over here, Prince, by the fire and talk about something. I want to hear you tell a story. I want to be fully convinced. And when I see the old Princess Bielakonskaya, I'll tell her all about you. I want them all to take an interest in you as well. Come along now. Say on. Maman, it's a very funny way of having to talk, you know, observed Adelaida, who had adjusted her easel meanwhile and taken up her brushes and palette to resume copying from a landscape print. Alexandra and Aglaya seated themselves together on the small sofa and, with arms folded, prepared to listen. The prince became aware that singular attention was being directed towards him from all sides. If I was ordered to do it like that, I wouldn't say anything at all, remarked Aglaya. Why not? What's odd about that? Why shouldn't he talk? He's got a tongue. I want to know how well he talks. Anything will do. Tell us what you thought about Switzerland. Your first impression. You'll see, he'll start in a minute, and very well, too. I was greatly struck, the prince began. There you are. Lizaveta Prokofievna seized on this eagerly, addressing her daughters. He started, hasn't he? At least let him talk, then, Mama. Alexandra stopped her. This prince may be a great fraud, and not an idiot at all, she whispered to Aglaya. Very likely. I could see that ages ago, answered Aglaya. And it's mean on his part to pretend. What does he think to gain by it? I was greatly struck by my first impression, repeated the prince. When I traveled out of Russia through various German towns, all I did was stare in silence, and I remember asking no questions. It was after a long series of severe and agonizing bouts of my illness, and I would always fall into a total stupor whenever the illness was intensifying or attacks came one after another. I lost the power of remembering things altogether, and although my mind went on working, it was as if my capacity for logical thought was disrupted. I couldn't string more than two or three ideas together at any one time, so it seems to me. Whenever the attack subsided, I grew well and strong again, just like now. I remember feeling unbearably sad. I felt like crying, even. I was in a continual state of wonderment and anxiety. It affected me terribly that all this was alien, that much I realized. It was this sense of the alien which was crushing me. I shook off this blankness completely, I recall, one evening in Baal, 
as we were entering Switzerland, and what roused me was the braying of an ass in the town market. That ass really astonished me. It greatly took my fancy for some reason, and at the same time my head seemed to clear suddenly. An ass? That's odd, remarked Madame Yapanchina. Though what's odd about it, one of us could well fall in love with a donkey, she remarked, glancing angrily at the giggling girls. It happened in mythology. Continue, Prince. Since then, I've been extremely fond of donkeys. There's a kind of common chord between us. I began asking questions about them because I'd never seen them before, and I became convinced at once that they are the most useful of creatures. Hardworking, strong, patient, cheap, and long-suffering. And through that donkey, I suddenly began to like everything about Switzerland, and my former sadness passed off completely. All this is very strange, but you can leave off about the donkey. Let's get on to something else. Why are you still laughing, Aglaya? And you, Adelaida? The prince told us about the donkey beautifully. He saw it himself. And what have you seen? You've never been abroad. I've seen an ass, Mama, said Adelaida. And I've heard one, too, added Aglaya. All three laughed again. The prince began laughing along with them. It's too bad of you, remarked Madame Yepanchina. You must excuse them, Prince. They're good-hearted, really. I'm always scolding them, but I love them just the same. They're scatterbrained and flighty, mad things. <coughs> well, why not? laughed the Prince. I wouldn't have missed the chance in their place either. I'm still on the side of the ass, though. The ass is a good and useful creature. And are you good? I'm just being curious, asked Madame Yepanchina. Everyone burst out laughing again. That wretched donkey again. I wasn't thinking of that at all, cried Madame Yepanchina. Please believe me, Prince, I wasn't... Hinting? Oh, I believe you, really I do. And the Prince continued laughing. I'm very glad you can laugh about it. I can see that you're a most good-natured young man, said Madame Yepanchina. Not always, the Prince replied. Well, I am put in Madame Yepanchina unexpectedly. If you want to know, I'm always good-hearted. It's my one failing, because one shouldn't be, not all the time. I very often lose my temper, with them, for example, and with Ivan Fyodorovich especially. But the awful thing is, I'm kindest of all when I'm angry. Just now, before you came in, I lost my temper and made out I didn't and couldn't understand what was going on. I tend to do that sometimes, just like a child. Aglaya taught me a lesson. Thank you, Aglaya. It's all nonsense, though. I'm not as silly as I seem, or as my daughters like to make me out. I have a mind of my own, and I'm no shrinking violet. I'm saying this without malice, by the way. Come over here, Aglaya, and kiss me. There, that's enough, she remarked when Aglaya had kissed her feelingly on lips and hand. Do go on, Prince. Perhaps you can remember something more interesting than a donkey. I still don't see how anybody can tell a story straight out like that, said Adelaida again. I wouldn't know how to start. But the prince will, because he's extremely clever. At least ten times more than you, maybe twelve. I hope you'll realize it after this. Prove it to them, prince. Do go on. The donkey can be left out of it, really. Well now, what did you see abroad apart from that? It was clever about the donkey as well observed Alexandra. What the prince said about his illness was very interesting, how he started liking everything after one external shock. I've always been interested in how people go mad and then recover their wits, especially if it happens suddenly. Really? Really? cried Madame Yepanchina. I see that you can sometimes be clever as well. That's enough laughing now. You had got up to the Swiss scenery, I think, prince. Now then. When we got to Lucerne, I was taken out on the lake. I thought it was splendid, but I felt wretched at the same time, said the prince. Why? asked Alexandra. I don't know. I always feel wretched and uneasy when I see nature like that for the first time. Happy and uneasy at the same time. However, I was still unwell at that time. Oh no, I would love to see it, 
said Adelaida. I don't know when we're going abroad. I haven't been able to find anything to paint for two years. Both East and South have long been pictured. Find me, Prince, a subject for a picture. I don't understand anything about it, really. It seems to me you just look and paint. I don't know how to look. Why talk in riddles? I don't understand this, Madame Yapanchina broke in. What do you mean, I don't know how to look? You've got eyes, use them. If you don't know how to look here, you won't learn abroad either. Better if you tell us how you looked yourself, Prince. Now that would be better, Adelaida said. The Prince learned how to look when he was abroad, didn't he? I don't know. Really, I just recovered my health there. I don't know if I learned to look or not. Incidentally, I was very happy almost all the time. Happy? You know how to be happy? cried Aglaya. So how can you say you never learned to look? You could teach us. Yes, teach us, please. Adelaida laughed. I can't teach anything, said the prince, laughing in his turn. I lived in that Swiss village practically all the time I was abroad. An occasional short trip outside. What have I got to teach you? To start with, it was just pleasant, and soon I began to recover my health. After that, every day became precious to me. The more so, the longer time went on, so that I began to notice it. I used to go to bed very contented, and rise even happier. Why all that should be so, I should be hard put to tell you. So you never felt like leaving? You felt no urge to go elsewhere? asked Alexandra. At first, at the very beginning, yes, there were times when I used to have very restless moods. I kept thinking how I was going to spend my life. I wanted to test the future that awaited me. There were certain moments when I used to feel restless. You know how those moments come, especially when you are alone. We had a waterfall there, quite a small one, dropping high off the mountain in a delicate thread, almost vertical, white, pattering, foaming. It fell from a great height, but it seemed quite low. It was a good half mile off, but it seemed only fifty yards away. I loved to listen to it at night. It was in moments like those that I sometimes reached a peak of anxiety. Also at midday sometimes, on mountain walks, I'd be alone among the mountains, pine trees all around me, ancient, tall, resinous. Up there on the rock, an old castle, medieval and ruinous. Our village far away below, barely visible, the sun bright in the blue sky, a fearful silence. It was there that I used to sense a something that kept calling me elsewhere. And it seemed that if I walked straight ahead for a long, long time, past the line, that line where the sky and earth meet, the whole puzzle would be resolved, and I should see a new life, a thousand times more vital and tumultuous than ours. I kept dreaming of a big city like Naples, all palaces, life, and thunderous noise. What didn't I dream? Then it seemed to me that even in prison one might discover an immense life. I read that last laudable sentiment in my school anthology when I was twelve, said Aglaya. It's all philosophy, observed Adelaida. You're a philosopher, come to teach us. Perhaps you're right smiled the prince. I am indeed a philosopher. And who knows, perhaps I really do mean to teach people. That's possible. Indeed it is. And your philosophy is exactly the same as Yulampia Nikolaevna's, Aglaya rejoined. She's a civil service widow, comes to us, a sort of hanger-on. Her one concern in life is cheapness, how cheaply one can live. All her talk is about kopecks, and yet she has money, you know. She's a complete fraud. It's the same with your immense life in prison, and perhaps your four years' happiness in the country that you sold your Naples for. At a profit, too, it seems, if only a few kopecks worth. As regards prison life, there is room for disagreement, said the prince. I heard the story of one man who had spent nearly twelve years in prison. He was one of my professor's patients. He had recurrent fits, and he would get restless sometimes used to cry, and once even tried to kill himself. His life in jail was very grim, I can assure you, but by no means to be measured in kopecks. 
And yet all the companionship he had was a spider and a sapling growing under his window. But better if I tell you of another man I met last year. He had a very strange story to tell. Strange because an incident like that happens only very rarely. This man was led out along with others onto a scaffold and had his sentence of death by shooting read out to him for political offenses. About 20 minutes later, a reprieve was read out and a milder punishment substituted. However, during the interval between the sentences, 20 minutes or quarter of an hour at least, he lived with a certain conviction that within minutes he would suddenly die. I was extremely eager to listen whenever he recalled his emotions of that time, and I started asking him about it on a number of occasions. He remembered everything with the utmost clarity, and he used to say that he would never forget anything of those minutes. About 20 yards from the scaffold, near where the people and soldiers were standing, three stakes had been dug into the earth, as there were several criminals. The first three were taken to the stakes and bound before being dressed in the death garments, long white smocks, and white hoods over their eyes so they couldn't see the rifles. Then a party of soldiers was lined up opposite each stake. My acquaintance was number eight, so he was due to go to the stake in the third group. A priest went round everyone with a cross. It worked out that he had five minutes to live, no more. He used to say that those five minutes seemed to him an eternity, an immense richness. It seemed that in those five minutes, he could live through so many lives, that there could be no thinking now of the last instant. He divided his time up. He calculated the time in which to say farewell to his comrades, and allotted some two minutes to that, then two more minutes to reflect upon himself, and then look about him for the last time. He clearly recalls making these dispositions and the way he calculated them. He was dying at 27, healthy and strong. In bidding goodbye to his comrades, he remembered asking one of them a somewhat irrelevant question and even being very interested in the answer. Then, after he had said goodbye to his comrades, came the two minutes he had set aside for thinking about himself. He already knew what he was going to think about. He kept wanting to imagine as swiftly and vividly as possible how on earth it could be that now he existed and was alive, and in three minutes' time, he would merely be something. Something or somebody, but who, though, and where? He thought he could resolve all this in two minutes. A church stood not far off, and its gilded roof sparkled in the sunshine. He remembered staring with an awful intensity at that roof and the sunlight glancing from it. He couldn't drag his eyes away. It occurred to him that those rays were his new state of being, and that in three minutes he would somehow merge with them. His revulsion at the unknown and the new, now that it was inevitable and imminent, was dreadful. But he says that nothing was more terrible at that moment than the nagging thought what if I didn't have to die? If life was returned to me? What an eternity it would be. And it would all be mine. I would turn every minute into an age. Nothing would be wasted. Every minute would be accounted for. Nothing would be frittered away. He used to say that this thought finally roused him to such a pitch of anger that he wanted them to hurry up and shoot him and have done with it. The prince suddenly fell silent. Everyone waited for him to go on and draw some conclusion. Have you finished? said Aglaya. What? Yes, said the prince, rousing himself from his momentary reverie. But why did you tell us about all this? Just, it came back to me. It seemed relevant. You're very abrupt, prince, remarked Alexandra. You probably wanted to demonstrate that one shouldn't value a single instant in mere copex, and that sometimes five minutes can outweigh a fortune. All very laudable, but if I may ask, this friend of yours who told you about his sufferings, he had his sentence commuted, didn't he? So he was presented with that eternal life. 
So what did he do with those riches afterwards? Did he account for every minute? Oh, no. He told me himself. I asked him about that. He didn't live like that at all and wasted an awful lot of minutes. So it follows from your example. It follows that one can't really live one's life counting every minute. It's just impossible for some reason. Yes, for some reason it's just impossible, the prince echoed. Well, that's what I thought myself. But somehow I just can't believe it all the same. That means you think you're going to live more wisely than anyone else, said Aglaia. Yes, I thought that too sometimes. And think so now? And think so now, replied the prince, smiling gently and almost timidly at Aglaia. Then all at once he laughed out loud again and looked brightly at her. Modesty indeed, said Aglaia, almost nettled. And how brave you are. Really, here you are laughing, and I was so shaken by all he told me, I dreamed about it, just those five minutes. He again gave his hearers an earnest and searching look. You're not angry with me for any reason, are you? He inquired suddenly, apparently disconcerted, but managing to look everyone straight in the eye. What for? cried all three girls, astonished. Well, because I keep lecturing you. Everyone laughed. If you are angry, don't be, he said. I'm well aware that I have less experience than others, and I'm less worldly wise than anybody. Perhaps I talk very strangely at times. Now he was definitely at a loss. If you say you were happy, that means you lived more, not less. Why do you wriggle and try to apologize then? began Aglaia, severely censorious. And please don't worry about lecturing us. You've nothing to be superior about. One could fill a hundred years of happiness with your sort of quietism. Whether you saw an execution or a little finger, you would draw equally laudable conclusions and still be happy. That sort of living's easy. What you keep getting so angry about, I fail to understand, said Madame Yepanchina, who had been observing the speaker's faces for a long time. And I don't understand what you're talking about either. What's all this nonsense about a finger? The prince talks beautifully, though a bit on the sad side. Why are you discouraging him? He was laughing when he started, and now he's quite depressed. It's all right, Mama. It's a pity you never saw an execution, Prince. I wanted to ask you something. I have seen one, responded the prince. You have? cried Aglaia. I should have guessed. That's the finishing touch. If you have seen one, how can you say you lived happily all the time? Well, aren't I right? They didn't execute people in your village, did they? Asked Adelaide. I saw it in Lyon. I went there with Schneider. He took me. I came across it as soon as I arrived. Well then, did you enjoy it? Was it very edifying? Was it instructive? Asked Aglaia. I didn't enjoy it at all. I was rather ill afterwards, but I admit I was riveted by the sight. I couldn't tear my eyes away. I couldn't have either, said Aglaia. They're very much against women going to watch. They even write about such women in the papers. If they say it's not suitable for women, by the same token they're saying it's all right for a man, and so justifying it. I congratulate them on their logic. You think the same way too, of course. Tell us about the execution, Adelaida interrupted. I would much prefer not at the moment. The prince was troubled and frowned slightly. It's as if you begrudge telling us, Aglaia reproached him. No, it's because I was telling someone about this execution just now. Who? Your footman, while I was waiting. What footman? Came from all sides. The one who sits in the entrance hall, with the graying hair, reddish face. I was sitting there before going in to see General Yepanchin. That's an odd thing to do, remarked Madame Yepanchina. The prince is a democrat, Aglaia put it bluntly. Well, if you've told Alexei, you can't refuse us now, can you? I would certainly like to hear it, Adelaida repeated. A little while ago, actually, the prince addressed her, quite animated once more. 
He seemed to get excited in a very quick and unaffected way. When you asked me to give you the subject for a picture, I actually thought of this one. Draw the face of a condemned man in the minute before the guillotine falls. While he's still standing on the scaffold before lying down on the plank they have. The face? Just the face? Asked Adelaida. A strange subject. And what kind of picture would that be? I don't know. Why on earth not? The prince insisted with some heat. I saw a picture like that in Baal not long ago. I'd very much like to tell you... I'll tell you some other time. It made a great impression on me. You must certainly tell us about the Baal picture later, said Adelaida. But now explain this execution picture for me. Can you tell me how you imagine it yourself? How should one draw that face? Just the face, yes? What kind of face is it, then? It is exactly a minute before death, began the prince perfectly readily, at once carried away by his recollection and apparently oblivious to all else. Just when he has climbed the stair and set foot upon the scaffold, that was when he glanced in my direction. I looked into his face and understood it all. But how can one convey it? I would be terribly pleased, terribly pleased, if you or anyone else could draw that face. Best of all, if it were you. At the time, I thought a picture would do a lot of good. To do it, one really has to imagine everything that had taken place earlier, every single thing. He had been living in prison and expecting to wait at least a week before the execution. He had been reckoning on the usual formalities, the documents being sent somewhere and taking a week to come back. But this time, for some reason, the process was curtailed. At five o'clock in the morning, he had been asleep. It was towards the end of October. At five o'clock, it's still cold and dark. The prison governor came in very quietly with a warder and touched him gently on the shoulder. He raised himself on one elbow and saw the light. What's the matter? The execution is at ten o'clock. Still half asleep, he didn't believe it, and started to argue that the document was only due in a week's time. But when he was fully awake, he stopped arguing and went quiet. That's what they told me. Then he said, Still, it's hard like this, all of a sudden. Then fell silent again, there being nothing more he wanted to say. Then, three or four hours go by on the usual things. The priest, breakfast for which he gets wine, coffee, and beef. Well, is that a mockery or not? Just think how cruel that is. And yet, on the other hand, honestly, these innocent people do it out of the goodness of their hearts, convinced they're being humane. Then comes the dressing up. You know what that involves for a condemned man. Then, finally, they take him through the town to the scaffold. I imagine he thinks he still has an eternity left to live while they're taking him. I imagine he probably thought as he went along, it's a long time yet, three streets yet to live. After this one, there's the next, then the one after with the bakers on the corner. It'll be ages before we reach the bakers. All around, there's the crowd, shouting, noise, 10,000 faces, 10,000 eyes. All that had to be born. And then, worst of all, the thought, there's 10,000 of them, and not one of them is being executed. But I am. Well, all that is by way of preliminary. The ladder is put up against the scaffold. Suddenly, he begins to weep in front of it. This strong and courageous man, a great evildoer, so they said. All this time, the priest has been inseparable from him, traveling with him in the cart, talking all the time, though hardly heard. He would start to listen, then fail to comprehend more than two words. It must have been so. Finally, he began to mount the ladder. His legs are bound so that he walks in tiny steps. The priest, a perceptive man, no doubt, stops talking and just keeps offering him the cross to kiss. At the bottom of the ladder, he had been very pale. But after he had climbed it and stood on the scaffold, he became as white as a sheet all of a sudden, as white as a sheet of writing paper. Probably his legs had gone numb. 
and were giving way. Then came nausea, as if his throat was being constricted and almost tickling him. Have you ever felt like that when you've been frightened or in moments of terror, when your reason remains perfectly clear but is no longer in control? I would think that in some inescapable disaster, like the house collapsing about you, for example, one would have an awful desire to just sit down, close one's eyes, and wait. What will be, will be. Just then, when this weakness was beginning, the priest, with a swift gesture, silently placed the cross to his lips. It was a little silver four-ended cross, and he kept putting it to his lips every minute. As soon as the cross touched his lips, he would open his eyes and come to life again, as it were, and his legs moved on. He kept kissing the cross avidly, hurrying to do so, as if anxious not to forget to take something with him just in case. But he would scarcely have felt anything religious at that moment. And so it went on, right up to the board itself. It's odd, but very few people faint in these last seconds. On the contrary, the brain is fearfully alive and active, must be working, 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 ever so hard like a machine. I can imagine all kinds of thoughts hammering away, all half-formulated, perhaps even absurd, irrelevant thoughts like, that one's staring, he's got a wart on his forehead. The executioner there, he's got a rusty bottom button. Yet all the while, you know and remember everything. There's a certain point you cannot forget, and you must not faint, and all things move and revolve around that point, and to think this goes on to the last quarter of a second when your head is lying on the block and waiting and knowing, and all at once it hears the iron sliding above. You would certainly hear that. Speaking for myself, if I was lying there, I would deliberately listen for it and catch the sound. There might only be the tenth part of an instant, but you would certainly hear it. And just imagine, people still argue that perhaps the head, when it flies off, knows for a second that it has done so. What an idea! And what if it were five seconds? Draw the scaffold so that the very last rung only can be seen clearly and close to. The felon has placed his foot on it. The head and face is white as a sheet. The priest is holding out the cross while the other greedily protrudes his blue lips and stares and knows everything. The cross and the head, that's the picture. The faces of the priest, the executioner, his two assistants and several heads and eyes from below, all that can be drawn in as distant background, indistinct, subordinate. That's the sort of picture it should be. The prince fell silent and regarded them all. That's not much like quietism, of course, said Alexandra to herself. Well, now tell us how you fell in love, said Adelaida. The prince stared at her in astonishment. Listen, Adelaida hurried on. You have still to tell us about the ball picture, but just now I want to hear about your being in love. Don't try to deny it, you were. Besides, as soon as you start telling a story, you stop being a philosopher. As soon as you stop speaking, you're ashamed of what you've been saying, Aglaia remarked suddenly. Why is that? Now that is just silly, said Madame Yepanchina sharply with an indignant look at Aglaia. Not clever at all, confirmed Alexandra. Don't believe her, Prince, Madame Yepanchina told him. She does that on purpose, out of spite. She's not as bad-mannered as that. Don't pay any attention to their teasing. They're probably up to something, but they already like you. I can read their faces. And I can read their faces, too, said the prince, emphasizing his words. What do you mean? asked Adelaida curiously. What do you know about our faces? the other two inquired. But the prince was silent and grave. Everyone awaited his answer. I will tell you later, he said, softly and earnestly. You're really trying to intrigue us, cried Aglaia, and so serious. Well, all right, Adelaida once more hurried on. 
But if you're such an expert on faces, then you must have been in love. That means I was right. Tell us the story, do. I was never in love, said the prince, quietly earnest as before. I was happy in a different way. How then? In what way? Very well. I'll tell you, said the prince, apparently deep in thought. Chapter 6 Here you all are, the prince began, looking at me with such curiosity that if I didn't satisfy it, you would probably be very angry with me. No, I'm just joking, he added hastily, smiling. There, there it was children all the time. I spent all my time with children, just children. They were the village children. The whole crowd of them at school. I didn't actually teach them. No, oh, no, there was a schoolmaster to do that. Jules Thibault. I did teach them a little bit as well, but I mostly just spent time with them all the four years I was there. I wanted nothing else. I used to tell them everything, keeping nothing back. Their parents and relatives used to get very angry with me because their children couldn't do without me in the end, always crowding about me. The schoolmaster finally got to be my worst enemy. I made a lot of enemies there, all because of the children. Even Schneider took me to task. What were they all so afraid of? You can tell a child everything, everything. I've always been struck by how little adults understand children, even their own fathers and mothers. Nothing should be kept from children on the pretext that they're little and it's too soon for them to know. Such a sad, wretched idea. Children themselves are well aware that their parents regard them as too small and uncomprehending when actually they understand everything. Adults don't realize that children can give extremely valuable advice in the most difficult situations. Heavens, when that pretty little bird looks at you, so happy and trusting, you are ashamed to betray it. I call them little birds because the earth holds nothing finer than a bird. Still, the main reason everybody in the village was angry with me was because of a certain incident. Thibault was simply jealous of me. At first, he kept shaking his head, wondering how it was that the children understood everything I taught them and practically nothing he did. Later on, he started laughing at me when I said that neither of us would teach them anything. They would teach us. How could he be jealous of me and tell stories about me when he lived among the children himself? The soul is healed through contact with children. There was one patient in Schneider's establishment, a most wretched individual. His plight was so dreadful that it can hardly be paralleled. He'd been sent there to be treated for insanity. In my view, he wasn't insane. He was simply terribly distressed. And that was the extent of his illness. If you only knew what our children came to mean for him in the end. Still, better if I tell you about that patient some other time. What I'll tell you now is how it all began. At first, the children didn't take to me at all. I was so big and awkward. I know I'm not very good looking either, and I was a foreigner to cap it all. They made fun of me at first, and later on they even started throwing stones at me when they caught sight of me kissing Marie. And I only kissed her once. No, don't laugh. The prince hastened to restrain his smirking audience. It wasn't anything to do with love. If you only knew what an unhappy creature she was, you would feel as sorry for her as I did. She was from our village. Her mother was an old woman who was permitted by the village council to partition off one of the two windows of her ramshackle little house and sell laces, thread, soap, and tobacco for coppers enough to live on. Her health was poor, and her legs were all swollen, so she always sat in the one spot. Marie was her daughter, about twenty, a feeble slip of a thing. She'd been developing consumption for long enough, but she still kept going round the houses as a daily, doing heavy cleaning work, washing floors, doing laundry, sweeping out yards, and mucking out livestock. A French commercial traveler passed by, seduced her, and carried her off. 
A week later, he abandoned her alone on the road and quietly disappeared. She arrived back home, begging her way, all begrimed and ragged, her shoes worn through. She had walked for a whole week, sleeping out in the fields and catching a severe chill. Her feet were bleeding and her arms swollen and chapped. Even before that, incidentally, she had been nothing to look at, though her eyes were placid, kindly and innocent. She was a terribly quiet girl. Once, before all this, she suddenly started singing, and I remember everybody being astonished and laughing. Marie singing, did you ever? Marie singing! And she got horribly self-conscious and kept quiet ever afterwards. People were still affectionate towards her then, but when she came back all ill and bedraggled, nobody showed her the slightest sympathy. They are so cruel over that sort of thing. Their views are so rigid. Her mother was the first to treat her with angry contempt. You have dishonored me now. She was the first to expose her to public disgrace. When the news got round the village that Marie had come back, everyone came running to have a look at her, and practically the whole village crowded into the old woman's hut. Old men, children, women, girls, everybody in such jostling, eager hordes. Marie was lying at the old woman's feet, hungry, ragged, and weeping. When everybody ran in, she just hid her face in her disheveled hair and pressed herself face down onto the floor. Everyone around regarded her as some sort of vermin. The old men condemned and berated her. The young folk laughed, even. The women scolded and blamed her, looking at her contemptuously as if she had been a spider. The mother let all this go on, just sitting there, nodding her approval. Her mother was very ill at that time, practically dying. In fact, she actually did die two months later. She knew she was dying, yet she still had no thought of forgiving her daughter till the time she died. She didn't say a word to her, and chased her out to sleep in the passage, hardly giving her anything to eat. She frequently had to stand her diseased legs in warm water, and every day Marie washed her legs for her and looked after her. But she accepted all these services in silence and never gave her a kindly word. Marie put up with everything, and I noticed later when I got to know her that she approved of all this herself. She thought of herself as the lowest of creatures. When the old woman finally took to her bed, the old women of the village came in turns to look after her, as the custom is there. At this point, they stopped feeding Marie altogether. In the village, they used to chase her away, and nobody even wanted to give her work, as they had done before. It was as if everyone despised her, and the men stopped regarding her as a woman, even, saying all manner of vile things to her. Sometimes, though very rarely, when the drinkers had had their fill on a Sunday, they used to throw down coppers for her, just like that, straight on the ground. Marie would pick them up in silence. She was coughing up blood even then. At length, her old clothes became so tattered that she was ashamed to show herself in the village. She had gone about barefoot since the time of her return. It was now that she began to be tormented, especially by the children, the whole gang of them about 40 or more, and even had filth thrown at her. She implored a herdsman to let her look after the cows, but he drove her away. Then she began going out with the herd all day without permission. Observing that she was extremely useful to him, the herdsman didn't chase her away this time. In fact, he would sometimes give her the leavings from his own dinner, bread and cheese, regarding this as a great kindness on his part. When the old woman did die, the local pastor didn't shrink from holding Marie up to public disgrace in church. She was standing over the coffin, just as she was, in her rags, weeping. A good many people had congregated to see her crying as she followed the coffin. Then it was that the pastor, still a young man, filled with hopes of becoming a great preacher, addressed them all, pointing to Marie. She was the cause of this worthy woman's death which was untrue because she'd been ailing for two years. 
Behold her standing before you, not daring to look because she has been marked by the finger of God. There she is, barefoot and in rags, an example to all who lose their virtue. Who is she then, that woman's daughter? And much more in the same vein. Can you imagine this vile stuff was much to the taste of practically all of them? But now something extraordinary happened. The children took her part. Because by this time, they were all on my side and had begun to feel affection towards Marie. It came about like this. I felt I must do something for Marie. She was in great need of money, but I never had a penny while I was there. I did have a small diamond pin, which I sold to a second-hand dealer who used to go round the villages trading in old clothes. He gave me eight francs for it, though it was worth all of forty. I tried for a long time to get Marie on her own. At length, we did meet behind a tree by the fence outside the village, along a side path leading up into the mountains. I gave her the eight francs and told her to take care of it because I wouldn't have any more. Then I kissed her and said she mustn't think that I had any evil intentions, that I was kissing her not because I was in love with her, but because I was very sorry for her and had never thought her guilty from the very first, merely unfortunate. I really wanted to console her there and then and assure her that she shouldn't see herself as beneath everyone, but I don't think she understood me. I could see that at once, though she said practically nothing the whole time, standing in front of me with her eyes cast down, dreadfully ashamed. When I'd finished, she kissed my hand, and I seized hers at once and made to kiss it, but she hastily pulled it away. It was then that the children caught sight of us, the whole crowd of them. I found out later that they had been keeping watch on me for a long time. They started whistling, clapping their hands and laughing while Marie took to her heels. I tried to talk to them, but they began pelting me with stones. That day, everybody knew, the whole village, and Marie took the brunt of it all again. They detested her more than ever. I heard it said they even wanted to have her legally punished, but nothing came of that, thank goodness. Still, the children wouldn't let her be, and tormented her worse than ever, pelting her with mud, chasing her as she ran from them breathless with her weak chest, shouting abuse after her. Once, I even rushed in to fight them off. After that, I began talking to them. Every day, I talked to them, whenever I possibly could. Sometimes, they would stop and listen, though they still kept abusing her. I told them how unhappy Marie was. Soon, they left off reviling her and went away in silence. Little by little, we began to get talking, and I concealed nothing from them. I told them everything. They listened to me very intently and soon began to feel pity for Marie. Some of them began to greet her kindly when they met her. It's the custom there, if you meet anybody, whether you know them or not, to bow and say good day. I can imagine how surprised Marie must have been. One day, two little girls got hold of some food and took it to her. After they gave it to her, they came to me and told me, they said Marie had burst into tears, and that they were now very fond of her. Before long, everyone else began to love her, and me too, suddenly along with her. They started coming to me often, asking me to tell them stories. I think I did this well because they all liked to listen to me. Later on, I studied and read everything just so as to have something to tell them afterwards. And I did this for all of three years. When I was accused by Schneider, too, later on for talking to them like grown-ups, hiding nothing from them, I used to answer that it was shameful to tell them lies, and they knew it all anyway, however much you kept from them. And they would find things out in a squalid sort of way, which was not the case with me. People should just recall how it had been when they were children. They didn't agree. I kissed Marie a fortnight before her mother died. By the time the pastor preached his sermon, the children were all on my side. I immediately told them what the pastor had done and interpreted it for them. They were all angered at him, 
and some went so far as to smash his windows with stones. I stopped them doing it because that was wrong. Still, everybody in the village got to know about it and started accusing me of corrupting the children. Then they found out that all the children loved Marie and were terribly alarmed. But Marie was happy by now. The children were forbidden to see her even, but they used to run to her on the sly out to the herd, quite a way off, almost a mile from the village. They took her presents, while others just ran to hug and kiss her and say, Je vous aime, Marie, before racing back again. Marie almost went mad from such unexpected happiness. She had never so much as dreamed of this. She was overjoyed, though bashful. But the main thing was that the children, the little girls especially, were very keen to run and tell her how much I loved her and how I was always talking to them about her. They said I had told them everything and that now they loved and pitied her and would always do so. Then they came running along to me with such joyful, flustered little faces to announce that they had just seen Marie and that she sent her greetings. In the evenings, I used to go to the waterfall. There was a place there completely secluded from the village side with poplars growing all around. It was there they came running to find me of an evening, some of them in secret even. I think they found my love for Marie terribly enjoyable. And yet, it was the one thing in all my life there in which I deceived them. I didn't disabuse them of the idea that I loved Marie, that I was in love with her, I mean, rather than merely being very sorry for her. I could tell that this was the way they wanted it, the way they had imagined it and settled it among themselves. So I kept quiet and pretended that they had guessed right. Those little hearts were so tactful and kind. It seemed impossible to them that Marie should be so barefoot and so poorly dressed when their kind Léon loved her so. Just imagine, they got hold of shoes and stockings for her, and under things, and even a dress of some sort. How they had contrived to do this, I have no idea. The whole crowd of them had a hand in it. Whenever I asked them about it, they just laughed gleefully, and the little girls clapped their hands and kissed me. Sometimes, I would go secretly to see Marie myself. She was very ill by now and scarcely able to walk. She had finally given up working for the cow herd, but still went out with the cattle every morning. She would sit down some distance away. There was a ledge under a sheer, overhanging rock, and she would sit there right in the corner, secluded from everyone, almost motionless the live long day, from morning till the cows were moving off home. By then, she was so weak from consumption that, for the most part, she sat with her eyes closed, leaning her head against the rock, dozing and breathing heavily. Her face was emaciated and skeletal, and sweat stood out on her forehead and temples. That was how I always found her. I used to come for a minute or so, and had no wish for anyone to see me either. As soon as I appeared, Marie would at once start open her eyes and fall to kissing my hands. I didn't withdraw them now, since it made her happy. All the time I sat there, she would tremble and weep. Several times she actually started saying something, but it was difficult to make anything out. She seemed demented at times, terribly agitated and ecstatic. Occasionally the children would come with me. When that happened, they used to stand not far off, guarding us from something or somebody. They got enormous pleasure from that. When we left, Marie was alone again, motionless as before, her head pressed against the rock, perhaps dreaming. One morning, she could no longer go out to the herd and stayed behind in her empty house. The children found out about this at once, and practically all of them came to visit her that day. She lay all on her own in bed, for two days, it was the children alone who looked after her, trotting in to her by turns. But later, when the village heard that Marie was actually dying, the old women began to come and sit by her. The village had begun to take pity on Marie. At any rate, they no longer tried to check the children or scold them as they had done formerly. Marie was drowsy all the time, her sleep restless. She coughed dreadfully. 
The old women chased the children away, but they used to run up to the window, sometimes only for a moment, just to say, Bonjour, notre bon mari. When she caught sight of them or heard them, she revived and, ignoring the old wives, struggled to rise on her elbow to nod her thanks to them. They brought her gifts, as before, but she hardly ate anything. Because of them, I assure you, she died almost happy. Through them, she forgot her own black misfortune, accepting absolution through them, as it were, because to the very end she continued to regard herself as a great sinner. Like little birds, they beat their wings against her windows and shouted to her every morning, Nous t'aimons, Marie. She died very soon after. I had thought she would live much longer. On the eve of her death, I called in to see her before sunset. She seemed to recognize me, and I pressed her hand for the last time. How shriveled it had become. Then suddenly in the morning, they came to tell me that Marie had died. The children couldn't be held back now. They decked her coffin with flowers and placed a garland on her head. In church, the pastor didn't shame the dead this time. There weren't many at the funeral in any case, just a few out of curiosity. But when it was time to carry the coffin, the children all rushed forward at once to bear it themselves. As they couldn't carry it, they did their bit to help, and all of them ran behind, weeping. Since then, the children have revered Marie's little grave. They deck it with flowers every year and have planted roses round it. But it was after the funeral that I was most persecuted by the village on account of the children. The pastor and the schoolmaster were the chief ones behind it. The children were strictly forbidden even to meet me, and Schneider undertook to see to this. Nevertheless, we continued to see each other and communicated by signs. They used to send me little notes. Later on, things were patched up and settled, but even at the time, it was all right. The persecution brought me even closer to the children. During my final year, I almost made peace with Thibault and the pastor. Schneider talked a good deal to me, arguing about my harmful system with the children, as if I had a system. At length, Schneider told me of a very strange notion he had conceived. This was just before my departure. He told me he was firmly convinced that I was a complete child myself, an absolute child. That it was only in the face and build that I resembled an adult, but in development, spirit, character, and perhaps intelligence, I was not a grown-up, and I'd stay that way, even if I lived to be 60. I was very amused. He's wrong, of course, a child indeed. But he was right about one thing. I really don't like being among adults, grown-up people. I've noticed that long since. I don't like it because I can't cope with them. Whatever they say to me, however kind they are to me, I never feel at ease with them for some reason. And I'm always terribly glad when I can get away to my friends. And my friends have always been children. But not because I am a child myself. It was simply because I have always been drawn to children. At the beginning of my time in the village, when I used to go off to brood alone in the mountains, and I came across the whole band of them sometimes, usually at noon when they were let out of school, making plenty of noise as they ran along with the little satchels and slates, shouting and laughing as they played their games. My soul began suddenly to reach out to them. I don't know, but I began to experience an intense sensation of happiness whenever I encountered them. I would stop and laugh from sheer gladness as I gazed at their little flashing legs, always running, at the little boys and girls running together, at their laughter and tears. Many of them contrived to fight, burst into tears, make up again, and start playing before they got home. And I would forget all about being depressed. Afterwards, in fact, for the next three years, I simply couldn't understand how and why people could ever be depressed. My whole life became centered on them. I never reckoned on leaving the village and it never entered my head that I would one day come here to Russia. I thought I should always be there. But one day, I realized that Schneider couldn't very well go on keeping me at his own expense, 
and a certain matter turned up, so important seemingly that Schneider himself urged me to go and wrote a letter on my behalf. I look into all that and discuss it with somebody. It may be that my life will be completely changed, but that's not the main thing. The main thing is that my life has already changed utterly. I left a lot behind there, a very great deal. It's all disappeared. As I sat in the railway carriage, I thought, now I'm on my way to be among people. Perhaps I don't know very much, but a new life has begun. I resolved to conduct myself honestly and firmly. I might be bored and miserable among people, but my first decision was to be polite and open with everyone. No one could ask more of me than that. Perhaps they would look on me as a child here as well. Let them. Everybody regards me as an idiot for some reason. I really was ill enough at one time to resemble an idiot, but hardly now when I'm well aware that they think of me as one. I come in and I think, now they regard me as an idiot. But I'm intelligent, really. They just don't realize. I often think like that. When I was in Berlin, I got some little letters they had already managed to write. It was only then I realized how much I loved them. It was very distressing to get that first letter. How sad they had been seeing me off. That had started a month before. Léon s'en va. Léon s'en va toujours. We would gather every evening by the waterfall like before and talk constantly of our parting. Sometimes it was as jolly as it had been before. When we separated for the night, though, they had taken to hugging me warmly, something they hadn't done before. Some of them used to run and see me secretly by themselves, just so as to hug and kiss me on their own, not in front of the others. When I was finally setting off, all of them together flocked to see me off at the station, which was about a mile from the village. They tried to stop themselves from crying, but many of them couldn't manage it and wept aloud, especially the girls. We were hurrying so as not to miss the train, but first one, then another, would rush out of the crowd just to embrace me on the road with his little arms and kiss me, so holding up the whole procession. Even though we were in a hurry, everybody stopped and waited while he said his farewells. When I got in the carriage and the train started moving, they all shouted out, Hurrah! and stood for a long time till the train was completely out of sight. And I was staring too. Do you know, when I came in just now and saw your nice faces, I look closely at faces now, and heard your first words, I felt my heart ease for the first time since then. I was already thinking just now that perhaps I was one of the really lucky ones. After all, I know that one doesn't often meet people one takes to at first sight, but I have met you straight away as soon as I got off the train. I'm very well aware that everyone is shy when it comes to talking of their own feelings, but here I am talking to you and not being shy at all. I'm not a sociable person, and perhaps I won't come to see you for a long time. I don't mean it like that. I didn't say that because I don't think highly of you, and don't imagine I've taken offense at anything. You asked me about your faces and what I saw in them. I will tell you with great pleasure. You have a happy face, Adela Ida Ivanovna, the nicest face of all three. Aside from the fact that you're very pretty, one looks at you and thinks, she has the face of a kind sister. You have a straightforward, cheerful manner, but you can quickly understand a person's heart. That's how your face seems to me. Your face, Alexandra Ivanovna, is also beautiful and very sweet. But perhaps you have a secret sadness. You have the kindest of hearts, no doubt of that, but you are not high-spirited. You have a certain something in your face reminiscent of the Holbein Madonna in Dresden. Well, so much for your face. Am I a good guesser? You said I was yourselves. But as for your face, Lizaveta Prokofievna, here he addressed Madame Yepanchina all of a sudden. From your face, I do not have to think. I am perfectly certain that you're an absolute child in everything, everything for good or ill, even though you're the age you are. 
You aren't angry with me for saying that. After all, you know my opinion of children. And don't go thinking I'm saying all this about your faces out of simplicity. Oh no, not at all. Perhaps I have my reasons too. Chapter 7 When the prince had concluded, they all looked brightly at him, even Aglaya, and especially Lizaveta Prokofievna. Well, you've certainly put him through an examination, she exclaimed. So then, dear ladies, you thought to take him under your wing like some poor little soul, but he hardly deigned to accept you himself, and even then with a the proviso that he'll only visit occasionally. We're the ones to look foolish, and I'm glad of it. Ivan Fyodorovich comes out worst of all. Bravo, Prince. We were instructed to put you through your paces just now. And what you said about my face is absolutely correct. I'm a child, and I know it. I knew that even before you told me. You put my thoughts in a nutshell. I believe your character is just like mine, and I'm very pleased, like two drops of water. Only you're a man and I'm a woman, and I've never been to Switzerland. That's the only difference. Don't be too sure, Maman, exclaimed Aglaya. The prince says he had a motive of his own in all his confessions. He wasn't just talking for talking's sake. Yes, yes, laughed the others. Don't make fun of him, my dears. He might be a bit craftier than all three of you put together. You'll see. But prince, why didn't you mention Aglaya? She's waiting, and so am I. I can't say anything now. I'll tell you later. Why, isn't she striking? Oh, indeed she is. You're extraordinarily beautiful, Aglaya Ivanovna. You're so pretty, one is afraid to look at you. Just that? No qualities? Madame Yepanchina pursued. It's hard to judge beauty. I'm not ready yet. Beauty is a puzzle. That means you've set Aglaya a puzzle, said Adelaida. Solve it then, Aglaya. She is pretty, though, Prince, isn't she? Marvelously, the Prince replied feelingly, his glance drawn to Aglaya. Almost as pretty as Nastasia Filipovna, though the face is totally different. They exchanged astonished glances. Like who? Madame Yepanchina brought out. Like Nastasia Filipovna? Where have you seen her? Which Nastasia Filipovna? Gavrila Adalyonovich was showing Ivan Fyodorovich her portrait just now. What? He brought Ivan Fyodorovich her portrait? To show him. Nastasia Filipovna gave her portrait to Gavrila Adalyonovich today, and he brought it to show. I want to see it, Madame Yepanchina burst out. Where is this portrait? If she gave him it, he must have it with him in the study. He always comes in to work on a Wednesday and never goes before four. Call Gavrila Ardalionovich at once. No, I'm not exactly dying to see him. Do me a favor, dear prince. Go along to the study, get the portrait from him and bring it here. Say we just want to see it, if you please. He's nice, but a bit on the simple side, said Adelaida when the prince had gone out. Yes, rather too much so, said Alexandra. It makes him a bit ridiculous, even. Neither of them seemed to be saying all she thought. Still, he got out of the face business well enough, said Aglaya. Flattered us all, even Mama. No clever remarks, please, cried Madame Yepanchina. He wasn't flattering, it was I who was flattered. You think he was being crafty? asked Adelaida. I fancy he's not so simple. Get away with you, said her mother, bristling. I think you're more ridiculous than he is. Simple, maybe, but he's got his wits about him. In the best sense, of course. Exactly like me. Of course, it was awful of me to blurt out that about the picture, the prince was thinking to himself as he entered the study his conscience troubling him somewhat. But perhaps it was for the best. An odd idea, still rather vague, had begun to take shape in his mind. 
Gavrila Adalionovich was still sitting in the study, engrossed in his papers. He obviously wasn't paid his company salary for nothing. He was horribly embarrassed when the prince asked for the portrait and related how the others had found out about it. Ech, why did you have to blab about it? He cried in savage annoyance. You know nothing about all this. Idiot, he muttered to himself. I'm sorry, I did it absolutely without thinking. It just slipped out. I said that Aglaya was almost as pretty as Nastasia Filipovna. Ganya asked for a more detailed account, and the prince obliged. Ganya gave him a derisive look. You've got Nastasia Filipovna on the brain, he muttered, but fell to thinking before finishing the sentence. He was clearly distraught. The prince reminded him about the picture. Listen, prince, said Ganya suddenly, as if struck by an idea. I have an enormous favor to ask of you, but I don't know, really. He paused, embarrassed. He was making his mind up about something and engaged in an internal struggle of some sort. The prince waited in silence. Ganya stared at him again, intently, searchingly. Prince, he resumed. Just now, the people through there, because of something really strange, ridiculous too, and I'm not to blame, well, irrelevant anyway, those people are a little cross with me, so I don't want to go through there for the time being unless they call me, and I badly need to speak with Aglaya Ivanovna. I've written a few words in case of need. A small, folded paper appeared in his hand, but I just don't know how to deliver it. Would you, Prince, undertake to pass it to Aglaya Ivanovna? But only to her. I mean, so that no one else sees. You follow me? It's not much of a secret. There's nothing out of the way. But you'll do it? I'm not very happy about it, replied the Prince. Oh, Prince, it's a case of desperate need, Ghani began, imploring him. She might answer, perhaps. Believe me, I would only have asked you in the most urgent, the most pressing circumstances. Who else can I entrust with it? It's extremely important, terribly important for me. Ganya was miserably afraid that the prince would refuse and gazed into his eyes with timid entreaty. Very well, I'll do it. But make sure no one notices, the delighted Ganya begged him. The thing is, I'm relying on your word of honor here, aren't I? I shan't show anybody, said the prince. The note isn't sealed, but Ganya blurted, over-anxious, then halted in embarrassment. Oh, I shan't read it, said the prince, quite simply, as he took the portrait and left the study. Ganya, left to himself, put his head in his hands. One word from her and I... and I really might break it off. The excitement and suspense prevented him sitting down to his papers again, and he began wandering round the room from one corner to another. The prince walked back, a prey to reflection. The commission troubled him, as did the thought of Ganya writing notes to Aglaya. Two rooms away from the drawing room, on his way back, however, he stopped short, as if recalling something, looked about him, then went over to the window near the light and began to study Nastasia Filipovna's portrait. It was as if he was trying to resolve some mystery hidden in that face which had struck him earlier. That recent impression had hardly abated, and now he was in haste to verify it once more. The extraordinary beauty of the face, along with something else about it, struck him even more forcibly now. It seemed to contain a boundless pride and scorn, almost hatred, and yet at the same time, something trusting, something astonishingly ingenuous. The contrast prompted a feeling approaching compassion in him as he gazed at those features. That dazzling beauty verged on the intolerable, the beauty of the pale face, the almost hollow cheeks, the burning eyes, a strange beauty indeed. The prince gazed for a minute or so, then suddenly bethought himself, looked about him, then swiftly brought the portrait close to his lips and kissed it. When he walked into the drawing room a minute later, 
his face was perfectly composed. As soon as he entered the dining room, however, two rooms before the drawing room, he almost collided with Aglaya coming out. She was alone. Gavrila Adalionovich asked me to give you this, said the prince, handing her the note. Aglaya halted, took the note, and gave the prince a rather odd look. There was no hint of embarrassment in her glance, apart from a glimmer of surprise, and that directed at the prince alone. Aglaya's gaze seemed to demand some explanation from him. How had he got mixed up in this affair with Ganya? A demand that was cool and lofty. They stood opposite one another for several seconds. At length, a look of faint derision came into her face. She gave a slight smile and walked past him. Madame Yepanchina studied Nastasia Filipovna's picture for some time in silence, evincing a certain disparagement as she held it at arm's length in showy affectation as far from her eyes as she could. Yes, pretty, she brought out at length. Very pretty, even. I've seen her once or twice, but only from a distance. Does that kind of beauty appeal to you? She suddenly addressed the prince. Yes, that kind, he replied with a certain effort. You mean just that kind? Just that kind. Why? In that face, there's a great deal of suffering, the prince went on, somehow reluctantly, seeming to be talking to himself rather than answering the question. I dare say you're talking nonsense, decided Madame Yepanchina, and with a lofty gesture tossed the picture away from her onto the table. Alexandra picked it up, and as Adelaida came over, both began to scrutinize it. At that moment, Aglaya returned to the drawing room. Such power, cried Adelaida suddenly, gazing avidly at the picture over her sister's shoulder. Where? What power? Lizaveta Prokofievna asked sharply. Beauty like that is power, said Adelaida warmly. With beauty like that, one could turn the world upside down. She walked thoughtfully over to her easel. Aglaya glanced only fleetingly at the picture, blinked and pushed out her lower lip as she sat down to one side and folded her arms. Madame Yepanchina rang. Call Gavrila Adarlionovich. He's in the study, she ordered the servant who had entered. Maman, cried Alexandra significantly. I just want a word or two with him, that's all. Madame Yepanchina snapped, silencing the protest. She was plainly irritated. As you see, Prince, we're all full of secrets here. Full of secrets. That's the done thing. A sort of etiquette. It's stupid. Especially in a matter which needs the utmost frankness, openness, and honesty. There's marriages in the air, and I don't like the sound of them. Maman, do you have to? Alexandra again hastened to stop her. What's the matter, dear daughter? Are you saying you like it yourself? What if the prince does here? We're friends, after all. At least he and I are. God seeks good people, of course, and he has no use for the wicked and wayward, the wayward ones especially, who decide one thing today and talk differently tomorrow. You follow me, Alexandra Ivanovna? They say I'm a queer one, prince, but I can tell people apart. The heart is what matters. The rest doesn't count. You need brains, too, of course. Perhaps that's what matters after all. Stop smiling, Aglaya. I'm not contradicting myself. A foolish woman with a heart and no brains is as bad as one with brains and no heart. Old but true. I'm the fool with the heart and no brain. You're the other way round. We're both miserable, and we both suffer. What are you so unhappy about then, Maman? Adelaida couldn't help asking, as the only member of the company who retained her good spirits. In the first place, from having clever daughters, snapped Madame Yepanchina. And since that's reason enough, there's no need to go into the others. There's been quite enough chatter. 
We'll see how the two of you, I don't count Aglaia, manage to extricate yourselves with all your cleverness and long words, and whether you'll be happy with your fine gentleman, my dear Alexandra Ivanovna. Ah, she exclaimed, seeing Ganya enter the room. Here comes another nuptial union. Good day. She responded to Ganya's bow without asking him to sit down. Are you contemplating marriage? Marriage? What? What marriage? Gavrila Adalyonovich mumbled aghast. He was dreadfully taken aback. Are you getting married? I'm asking you, if you prefer that expression. N no. I... No. Lied Gavrila Adalyonovich, shame flooding his cheeks with color. He shot a swift glance at Aglaya as she sat apart and quickly averted his eyes. Aglaya's cool, calmly intent gaze was fixed upon him as she contemplated his confusion. No? Did you say no? Pursued the implacable Lizaveta Prokofievna. Very well. I will remember that today, Wednesday morning, you answered no to my question. It is Wednesday today, isn't it? I believe so, Maman, responded Adelaida. They never know what day it is. What's the date? The 27th, Ganya replied. 27th? That's good for another reason. Goodbye, then. I expect you are very busy, and I have to dress and go out. Don't forget your portrait. Give my regards to poor Nina Alexandrovna. Au revoir, dear prince. Come and see us often, and I'll drop by on old Princess Bielakonske especially to tell her about you. And listen, my dear, I believe that God has brought you from Switzerland to Petersburg just for my sake. You may have other things to attend to, but I'm the main reason. It's God's purposes at work. Au revoir, my dears. Alexandra, come to my room, dear. Madame Yepanchina went out. Ganya, crestfallen, distraught, and in a foul temper, picked the portrait up from the table and, with a twisted smile, addressed the prince. Prince, I'm going home now. If you're still minded to live with us, I can drive you, otherwise you won't know the address. Wait a little, prince, said Aglaya, suddenly rising from her chair. I'd like you to write in my album. Papa said you had a fine hand. I'll just bring it. And she left the room. Au revoir, Prince. I must be going too, said Adela Ida. She squeezed his hand hard, smiled at him with cordial affection, and went out. She didn't look at Ganya. It was you, grated Ganya, rounding on the Prince as soon as they had all gone. It was you letting on to them that I was going to get married, he muttered in a swift undertone, his face working and his eyes furious. Shameless blabbermouth! I assure you, you're mistaken, the prince replied, calmly polite. I didn't even know you were getting married. You heard Ivan Fyodorovich talking about everything being decided tonight at Nastasia Filipovna's. That's what you told them. Don't lie. How could they have known? Who the devil could have told them apart from you? The old woman was dropping the hint, wasn't she? You know better than I who told them. If you think the hint was directed at you, I never said a word about it. Did you hand over the note? Any answer? Ganya interrupted, hotly impatient. But Aglaya returned just at that moment, and the prince was unable to reply. There you are, prince, said Aglaya, placing her album on the table. Choose a page and write me something. Here's a pen. It's a new one, too. Does it matter if it's got a steel nib? I've heard calligraphists don't use steel nibs. As she spoke to the prince, she appeared not to notice Ganya's presence. But while the prince was adjusting the pen, choosing a page and making his preparations, Ganya walked over to the fireplace where Aglaya was standing close to the prince's right and in a faltering, trembling voice spoke almost in her ear, one word, just one word from you and I'm saved. The prince turned swiftly and looked at them both. Ganya's face registered genuine despair. He seemed to have uttered the words without thinking, 
on a sudden impulse. Aglaya regarded him for several seconds with precisely the same expression of cool astonishment she had directed towards the prince a little while before. It seemed this cool astonishment of hers, this bewilderment, this apparent total incomprehension of what was said to her, was for Ganya at that moment more terrible than the most withering contempt. What shall I write then? inquired the prince. I'll dictate it to you, said Aglaya, turning to him. Are you ready? Very well. Write, I do not bargain. Now write the day and month underneath. Show me. The prince gave her the album. Excellent. You've done it beautifully. You have a wonderful hand. Thank you. Now au revoir, prince. Wait, though, she added, as if suddenly remembering something. Come with me. I want to give you a keepsake. The prince followed her, but as they came into the dining room, Aglaya stopped. Read this, she said, handing him Ganya's note. The prince took it and looked at Aglaya in bewilderment. I know very well you haven't read it, and you can't be in that man's confidence. Read it. I want you to read it. The note had evidently been written in haste. Today, my fate is to be decided. You know how. Today, I have to give my irrevocable word. I have no right whatever to your sympathy and do not dare to nurture any hopes. But once you spoke a word, just one word, and that word lit up the black night of my life and became for me a beacon. Speak one more such word to me and you will save me from disaster. Just tell me, Break the whole thing off, and I'll do it this very day. Oh, does it cost so much to say it? I only ask for that word as a token of your sympathy and pity for me. Only that. Only that. Nothing more whatever. Nothing. I dare not cherish any hope because I am not worthy of it. But after a word from you, I will take up my poverty again and rejoice to endure my desperate plight. I will take up the struggle and rejoice in it. I will be reborn with strength renewed. Send me that word of compassion, compassion alone, I swear. Do not be angry at the presumption of one in despair, a drowning man who nerves himself to make one last effort to save himself from perishing. G.I. This man assures me, said Aglaya harshly when the prince had finished reading, that the words break the whole thing off will not compromise me and commit me to nothing. He gives me a written guarantee himself, as you see in this note of his. See how naively quick he is to lay stress on certain words and how crudely his real intent shows through? And yet he knows that if he had broken it off by himself without any word from me, not even telling me and with no claim on me at all, then I would have altered my opinion of him and perhaps become his friend. He is perfectly aware of that, but he has a mean soul. He knows, and yet he can't bring himself to act. He knows, and still he asks for guarantees. He's incapable of acting on faith. He wants me to give him hopes of my hand in exchange for the hundred thousand. As for the word he talks about in the note, that I once spoke and supposedly lit up his life, it's a barefaced lie. I just felt sorry for him once. But he's bold, and he has no sense of shame. It immediately struck him that here was a semblance of hope. I realized that at once. Ever since he's been angling for me, he's still at it. But enough is enough. Take his note and give it him back, this minute. When you get out of the house, of course, not before. What answer shall I give him, then? Nothing, of course. That's the best answer. So you intend living in his house? Your father recommended that himself this morning, said the prince. Well, be on your guard against him, I warn you. He'll never forgive you for giving him his note back. Aglaya squeezed his hand lightly and left. Her expression was grave and frowning. She didn't even smile as she nodded her farewell to the prince. I'm coming, I'm just getting my bundle, said the prince to Ganya. Then we'll be off. Ganya stamped his foot impatiently, his face darkening with fury. 
At length, they both emerged into the street, the prince with his bundle in his hands. The answer, the answer, Ganya turned on him. What did she say to you? Did you give her the letter? The prince silently handed him the note. Ganya froze. What? My note? he cried. He didn't give her it. Oh, I should have guessed. Oh, damnation. Of course she didn't understand a thing just now. But why, why, why on earth didn't you give it to her? Oh, double damn. I'm sorry. On the contrary, I managed to give her your note straight away. The moment you gave it to me, exactly as you wished. I have it now because Aglaya Ivanovna gave it back this minute. When? When? As soon as I'd finished writing in the album, when she asked me to go with her, as you heard. We went into the dining room, and she gave me the note, told me to read it, and to return it to you. Read it? cried Ganya, almost at the top of his voice. Read it? You read it? He again halted in the middle of the pavement, stupefied, his mouth wide open in astonishment. Yes, I read it just now. And she gave it to you to read herself? Herself? Do believe me. I wouldn't have looked at it without her invitation. Ganya was silent for a minute, in an agony of thought, then suddenly exclaimed, It's impossible. She couldn't have told you to read it. You're lying. You read it yourself. I am speaking the truth, replied the prince in a completely imperturbable fashion as before. And believe me, I am very sorry to see it upset you so much. Wretched creature. But at least she said something to you at the same time, didn't she? She made some sort of reply, didn't she? Yes, of course. Then tell me. Tell me, damn it. Ganya twice stamped his galoshed right foot on the pavement. As soon as I'd read it, she told me you were angling for her. You wanted to compromise her into giving you hope, and, relying on that hope, abandon your hopes for the hundred thousand without risk. That if you had done that without bargaining with her, and broken the thing off yourself without asking guarantees from her in advance, she might possibly have become your friend. I think that's all. Yes, one more thing. When I had already taken the note, I asked her what answer I should give you then, and she said no answer was the best answer. I think that was it. I'm sorry if I can't remember her exact words. I'm saying it as I understood it myself. Ganya was seized by a boundless rage, and his fury burst out unrestrained. So, that's the way of it, he ground out. Throw my notes out of the window. So, she won't bargain, but I will. Then we'll see. I have a trick or two up my sleeve yet. We'll see. I'll show her who's master. He had turned pale, his face working and his lips frothing. He shook his fist. So they walked on a few yards. He made no attempt to observe the niceties as far as the prince was concerned and behaved as if he were alone in his own room. He regarded him as a complete non-entity. All of a sudden, however, he was struck by a thought and recollected himself. But how on earth, he asked the prince abruptly, how on earth could you, an idiot, he added to himself, how could you be on such confidential terms two hours after meeting them for the first time? How did it happen? Only jealousy had been wanting to make his torment complete. Now it suddenly pierced him to the heart. That I can't explain to you. Ganya looked at him grimly. It wasn't to present you with her confidence that she called you into the dining room, was it? She intended to give you something, didn't she? I can't account for it otherwise. Then what was it, for God's sake? What did you get up to in there? Why did they take such a fancy to you? Look! He was acutely fidgety. Everything within him at that moment seemed to be in a seething turmoil. He simply couldn't collect his thoughts. Look, can't you just remember something of what you talked about in there and put it in some sort of order? 
What exactly you talked about, all the words from the very beginning, anything you remember noticing? Oh, I can certainly do that, responded the prince. To begin with, after I'd come in and been introduced, we started talking about Switzerland. Oh, to hell with Switzerland. Then about capital punishment. Capital punishment? Yes, it just came up. Then I told them about my living there for three years. Then a story about a poor village girl. Oh, to hell with the poor village girl. Get on with it. Gagne was bursting with impatience. Then Schneider's opinion about my character and how he made me... Confound Schneider and damn his opinions, get on! After that, I got onto faces, facial expressions, I mean, and said that Aglaya Ivanovna was almost as pretty as Nastasia Filipovna. That's when I let it out about the portrait. But you didn't tell them, you surely didn't tell them what you'd just heard in the study, did you? No? I tell you again, I did not. Then where the devil? Bah! Aglaya didn't show the note to the old lady. I can completely reassure you on that point, she did not. I was there all the while. She didn't have time, either. Still, you might not have noticed. Oh, wretched idiot! He exclaimed, now absolutely beside himself. He can't even tell a story properly. Having once started swearing without encountering remonstrance, Ganya gradually cast off all restraint, as is invariably the case with some people. A little while longer, and he might well have begun spitting. Such was his fury. And yet it was this same fury which blinded him. Otherwise, he would have noticed long before that this idiot he was berating was sometimes capable of very swift and subtle understanding and could give a perfectly adequate account of events. But, all of a sudden, something unexpected occurred. I must point out to you, Gavrila Ardalionovich, the prince said suddenly, that formerly I was so ill that I actually was almost an idiot. I recovered from that a considerable time ago, however, and it is somewhat unpleasant when I am called an idiot to my face. Although you may be forgiven, bearing in mind your disappointments, you have already abused me twice in your annoyance. I don't like it at all, especially just like that, suddenly, on first acquaintance. Since we are standing at a crossroads, would it not be better for us to part? You turn right towards your house, and I to the left. I have twenty-five roubles, and I'm sure to find some lodging house. Ganya was horribly embarrassed, and even blushed for shame. Forgive me, Prince, he cried hotly, abruptly altering his abusive tone to one of extreme politeness. Do please forgive me. You see the trouble I'm in. You still know practically nothing about it, but if you knew everything, you would surely forgive me at least a little, though of course it was inexcusable. Oh, there's no need for any profuse apologies, the prince hastened to reply. I do understand how unpleasant it is for you, and that's the reason for your rudeness. Well, let's go on to your house. I'll come with pleasure. No, I can't let him go now just like that, thought Ganya to himself, glancing savagely at the prince as they walked on. This rogue squeezed it all out of me, then suddenly dropped the mask. There's something behind all this. Well, we'll see. All will be decided. Everything. This very day. By now... They had reached the house. Chapter 8 Ganya's flat was on the second floor, reached by way of a clean, bright, and spacious staircase. It comprised six or seven rooms, large and small, nothing special in themselves, but rather beyond the means of an office worker with a family, even one earning two thousand a year. It had been taken over by Ganya's household some two months before, and had been laid out, to Ganya's utter disgust, as separate flatlets with board and service, at the insistent request of his mother and sister, who had wanted to make themselves useful and increase the family income by however little. Ganya would scowl and call it outrageous to take in boarders. Subsequently, he began to feel somewhat ashamed in polite society, 
where he was accustomed to cut a figure as a young man with prospects and a certain polish. All these concessions to necessity and the consequent exasperating feeling of constriction were deeply wounding to Ganya's spirit. Of late, he had begun to get intensely, disproportionately upset over trifles. If he was willing for the moment to resign himself and show patience, it was only because he had resolved upon altering and refashioning the situation in the very near future. Meanwhile, this very process of change, the escape route he had decided upon, was presenting no small difficulty. It was a problem whose resolution bid fair to be more troublesome and agonizing than anything which had gone before. The apartment was divided by a corridor which led from the hallway. The three rooms for letting to specially recommended lodgers were on one side of this corridor. There was also a fourth room, smaller than the others, right at the end by the kitchen, where lived the retired General Evelgen himself, the head of the family. He slept on a broad sofa, and in order to enter or leave the flat, was obliged to go through the kitchen and down the back stairs. Gavrila Adalyonovich's 13-year-old schoolboy brother, Kolya, lived here as well. He had to squeeze himself in to do his studying and sleep on another sofa, ancient, narrow, and short, with a sheet full of holes. Above all, he had to look after and keep an eye on his father, who was becoming more and more dependent on such attention. The prince was allotted the middle room of the three. The first one, to his right, was occupied by Ferdyshenko, while on his left, the third stood vacant for the moment. Ganya initially conducted the prince into the family half of the apartments, however. This consisted of a hall, converting at need into a dining room, a drawing room, which fulfilled that function only in the mornings, however. It turned into Ganya's study cum bedroom later on in the day. And finally, a tiny third room, which was always kept locked. This was the bedroom of Ganya's mother and sister. In a word, Everything in the apartments was cramped and constricted. Ganya just had to grit his teeth. Although he was and wished to be respectful towards his mother, it was obvious from the first moment that he was the tyrant of the family. Nina Alexandrovna was not alone in the drawing room. Her daughter Varvara was sitting with her. Both of them were busy knitting as they conversed with a visitor Ivan Petrovich Petitsin. Nina Alexandrovna seemed about 50 with a pinched, sunken face, very dark under the eyes. She had an ailing look about her and an air of mourning, though her face and expression were quite attractive. Her first words bespoke a serious nature full of genuine dignity. Notwithstanding her melancholy look, one could sense a firmness in her, resolve even. She was dressed extremely modestly in something dark, old lady fashion, but her deportment, conversation, her whole manner, in fact, pointed to her as a woman familiar with a better class of society. Her daughter, Varvara, was a girl of about 23, of medium height and rather on the thin side. Her face wasn't exactly pretty, but possessed the secret of being winning without being beautiful, and was really remarkably attractive. She was very like her mother, even sharing her strong disinclination to dress ostentatiously. Her gray eyes might sometimes have been very gay and affectionate, if they had not been more often grave and pensive. Sometimes too much so, especially of late. The strength and resolution could be seen in her face, too. But one got the impression that her strength could be much more dynamic and resourceful than that of her mother. Varvara was rather quick-tempered, and her brother went somewhat in fear of that temper. Among those who shared this apprehension was their present visitor, Ivan Petrovich Ptitsin. He was still quite a young man, around 30, elegantly though unobtrusively dressed, with manners which were attractive but somehow a little too solemn. His small, dark brown beard indicated that he wasn't in the government service. His conversation was clever and interesting, but more often than not, he was silent. On the whole, he made a pleasing impression. 
He was clearly not indifferent to Vavara Ardalionovna and didn't hide his feelings. She treated him in friendly fashion, but some of his questions were not to her liking and she delayed before answering. Ptitsin, however, was far from being discouraged. Nina Alexandrovna was nice to him and of late had begun to confide in him to a considerable extent. It was common knowledge, though, that his main activity was lending money at high interest or more or less reliable security. Was he was exceedingly no friendly with Ganya. Right. After an abrupt, Imagine. though circumstantial, introduction by Ganya, no, who gave his no mother the coldest oh, of greetings, I, I ignored his sister, point. and at ah, once led Ptitsin out of the room, I gotta, I gotta, Nina said a few one pleasant one words one to the prince and told oh. Kolya, who was peeping in at the door, to take him to the middle room. Kolya was a pleasant boy with a cheerful face and a trusting, unaffected manner. Where are your things then? He asked as he led the prince into the room. I've just got a bundle. I've left it in the hall. I'll fetch it directly. We only have the cook and Matriona, so I help out as well. Varya supervises everything and gets cross. Ganya says you arrived from Switzerland today. Yes. Is it nice there? Very. Mountains? Nope. Yes. I'll go bring your bundle. You're going to be the one Bavara that fucking comes last like a biscuit. Matriona will make your bed presently. Do you have a suitcase? No, a bundle. Yes, your brother's gone for it. It's in the hall. I how many people have There's nothing there apart from this little biscuit. one. Where did you put them? Asked Kolya, like, returning. It must have happened. Can't there aren't any legend, apart from that, that, the prince shit. announced, oh taking God. his bundle. I got my entire pledge class. Ah, so I thought Ferdyshenko might have carried them all. Don't tell lies. That said Vavara severely. She was barely polite, even to the prince, oh, and God. spoke extremely coldly. Like, even if everyone agreed to the game, like, you might treat like me more affectionately. End, I'm not petite, <laughs> you know. They would have to be, like, you're lucky to escape you whipping, you're so silly. You know, like, it, Ask Matriona for anything you want. Dinner is at half past right, four. <laughs> you can eat with us or have it in your room as you wish. Come on, Kolya, don't get in the way. That seems right. Let us go there, no oh, woman God. of decision. Oh, fuck. Like, oh, even my own As they left, they like, encountered Ganya. Like, Is father in? Like, Ganya asked Kolya, and on receiving an affirmative reply, whispered fuck, something in his ear. Kolya nodded and went out after his sister. Nothing to do with that conversation. A word, Prince. I forgot You're to mention about this business. I have a favor to ask. He would you oblige me, if it isn't asking too much, by not mentioning here what is passed between me and Aglaya, or speak at the Yapanchins of what you may find here? Because things are at a pretty pass here, too. Still, to hell with it. At least restrain yourself for today, at least. Things are getting better and better, and I'm still... I do assure you, I said a good deal less than you think. I'm saying it's said better to have an echo than somewhat miss nettled all the by Ganya's reproaches. Like echoes, Their like, relations were clearly becoming more and more strained. Well, I've gone through a lot today because of you. Anyway, I'm asking you. I must point out also, Gavrila Ardelionovich, that it? I was in no way bound not to mention um, the portrait this afternoon. Here it's you didn't empty. ask me, did you? What a horrid so room, remarked Ganya, looking Where's about him disdainfully. Dark I'm not the view there, of the yard. Mars. You've come at an awkward time for us in every way. Uh, well, that's no business of mine. I'm not sure. I don't let the oh, apartment. Oh, so it's either... Oh, it's probably... It's Petitsin looked in and called Ganya, well, who hastily yeah, deserted the prince and left, the hours, despite so having something more to say. He was obviously ill at ease and nervous about coming out with it, like, finding fault with the room and his embarrassment. Like I did pretty well, but my wrist, I don't know. I should, I Scarcely had the prince washed and managed to tidy really himself well up somewhat when the door problems. opened and a new personage peered round it. This was a gentleman of around 30, stocky, broad-shouldered, oh, and with a huge Maggie. ginger curled head. Maggie. His fleshy face was florid, with Otherwise thick lips and a broad, McGee. flat nose. Uh, Irish, His small talk, eyes McGee, were bleary and mocking, as if perpetually right, weeping. The overall impression was one of insolence. <laughs> His clothes were rather grubby. <laughs> to begin with, he opened the door just enough to insert his head. 
The head Wasn't surveyed the room for about five seconds. Nothing. Then the door began to open gently, and the entire figure appeared. Oh, uh, yeah, I just, I actually the visitor, that however, for now. Um, didn't it's enter. The idiot plus he music. stayed regarding the prince from the threshold. At length, he closed the door behind him, approached, yeah. sat down on a chair, seized the prince firmly you know, by no, the probably hand, and placed him on the shit. sofa almost opposite. Um, actually, uh, fuck, no, I cer no, I cer said he, Nothing's playing in the with a keen and searching look at the prince. Yeah, I did that. Yes? Responded the prince, <sighs> almost I mean, laughing no, I out these loud. Guys come over. I'm fucking tired. Logic, <laughs> said Ferdyshenko again, staring as before. You wish to be acquainted? Mr. John owes me money. I have been selling him weed at ridiculous the visitor, prices. Said the visitor, sighing as he ruffled his back, hair. So fuck it. Right. He began staring at the opposite corner of the room. Have you got any money? He addressed the prince all of a sudden. A little. How much, exactly? 25 rubles. I'll probably, I don't know. I'll probably Show be me then. back to Yoda at some point. So. Oh, wait, you didn't. The prince you took the 25 you. ruble note from his waistcoat pocket <laughs> and gave it to Ferdyshenko. <laughs> He unfolded it, examined it, then turned it over and finally held it against the light. It's rather odd, he spoke as if ruminating. Why should they go brown? Yeah, I mean, I might have bought These 25 are sometimes go really brown. What am I doing? And others fade completely. Here. The prince took his note. Back. For bread. It's fucking good. Ferdyshenko rose from his chair. I was just dipping it. And I came to warn you. First, store. don't lend me money. I don't know. Because I'll certainly be I asking. I could become bougie. Very well. You intend to pay here? I do. And I don't. I, mean, I can buy a loaf of bread for a dollar and it's fine. It's I'm the first bigger. door on the right from you. Did you see? But you buy one for four. Try not to come and see me too often. That's good. I'll come to see you. Never fear. Have you seen the general? No. And not heard him? Of course not. Well, you will see and hear him. He tries to borrow money from me, even. Avis au lecteur. Goodbye. Can one really live with a surname like yeah, Ferdyshenko? Uh, I don't think I've ever eh? been this organized before. It's pretty weird. Why ever not? Goodbye. Maybe when I was a little kid. And he walked to the door. Since I gave up on being a... The prince freak. learned later that this Finally gentleman said, had taken it upon himself to astonish everyone like with his originality and high bit. spirits, though it never yeah, quite came off. Bit. He even impressed Keep some here. people unpleasantly, oh, yeah, a yeah, fact some, which I'm, grieved him but didn't I've prevent never... him from pursuing his task. In the doorway, he managed to recover lost ground, as it were, oh, by man, stumbling I, I, against I, I another gentleman who was coming in. As he let this new visitor, unknown to the prince, into the room, he gave several warning winks from behind his back, and Five thus contrived to make a reasonably effective day. exit after all. The new arrival was a tall a man of about that. 55 or a little older, a rather fry. stout with a, a fleshy, purplish red that. face whose flabbiness was framed in bushy grey side whiskers and moustache. He had large, rather also, prominent this eyes. This his I figure would have been quite bad. dignified had there not been something neglected and slovenly, even I I, grubby I, I, I about it. Really well, he wore an ancient, out-at-the-elbows frock coat, and his linen was also it's soiled like so in a round-the-house like fashion. Close to, there was a slight whiff of vodka. His demeanor was happened. striking, nevertheless, though rather studied and obviously designed to create a too. dignified impression. Like him, he approached the prince slowly, with a welcoming smile, silently took his That's hand, and something. while retaining it, peered into his face for some time, as if recognizing familiar features. Uh, Mars has been filling in it's him. Though, so not, like, I have two fans. Him. He you know spoke Mars, right? with quiet solemnity. To the life. I hear them repeating the dear familiar name, and I recall the dead past. Prince Mishkin. It is indeed. Yeah, that General Evilgin, retired yep. and wretched. Your first name, or less, yep. if I may be so bold, Lev Nikolaevich. You're a Christian. That's I... it. <laughs> That's <laughs> it. The son of my friend and uh, childhood the, companion Nikolai Petrovich. What's with the negativity? My father's name was Nikolai Lvovich. No, I'm not. Lvovich. The general corrected himself. <laughs> 
but unhurriedly and with complete confidence, as if it had been a mere slip of the tongue rather than forgetfulness. He seated himself and, taking the prince's hand, sat down beside him. I carried you in my arms, sir. How do you, how do you really? believe that shit? It's fucking said the prince. crazy. I mean, I think my a lot of father are just died all of 20 years ago. Contra- like it's the side yes, where most 20 years. People aren't. So there's 20 room years there and if three you're months. not an idiot to at least we went to school together. Stand out a little bit. I went straight into the army. Yes, my father was in the army I mean, too. He's insane, but he's not a sub lieutenant in the Vasilkovsky regiment. Is he? The Bielomirsky. He was transferred to the Bielomirsky just um. before he died. On some things, I stood there and blessed him to like his eternal rest. Brains, but I think Your dear mother, like the, the general, paused as if in sad reflection. But she died as well, six months later from a chill, said the prince. Like it's hard to read. Like Not a lot of from a chill. Half-word. Not from a chill. Take an old man's word. I was there at the funeral. Be normal, you know. It was from grief for I her prince. I guess normal is like Not a, a relative chill. term. But yes, how I remember you know the I mean. princess, ah, uh, youth. It was because of and her that the prince and I, lifelong friends, way, almost but, became each other's um, murderer. The same way that, like, military spending The prince began this thing with a it's certain not the only skepticism. Way, and it can be extremely I was still passionately in love with your mother way. when she was betrothed, betrothed you gotta, to my you, you friend. You gotta use those bombs. You gotta the use prince those noticed crosses, right? and was shocked. Yeah, fuck, use them. He comes to me one morning at seven and wakes me up. I get dressed, astonished. Not a word on either side. I understood. Takes out a brace of pistols from his pocket. Across the handkerchief. No witnesses. No, what need of them on, uh, if we were sending each other into eternity in five minutes' time? Years, so. We loaded, spread the handkerchief out, braced ourselves, and aimed at the heart as we looked one another in the face. Second. Suddenly... Tears flooded I mean, from our eyes, idiots, and our hands right? shook, <laughs> both of us, both at the same time. Well, then came the embraces, of course, each I mean, of us outdoing else, the other in generosity. The prince them. shouts, she's yours. I shout, yours. Well, in short, in short, you've Straight come up. here. Look at that. Straight up. To live? Bougie as fuck, American yes. watermelon. For a time, perhaps, said the oh, prince, yeah. seeming to hesitate slightly. Is that just like a Prince, watermelon? Mama or? asks you to come and see her. It's like that. No, 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 no. glancing it's in like, at the doorway. Uh, I'm a nice but watermelon. The prince half rose to go, mm. but the general placed Water his right learning. palm on his shoulder in friendly fashion and set him down on the sofa again. As a true friend of your father, I want to warn you said the general. As you can see, I am the victim of a tragic misfortune. But no court involved, no trial. Nina Alexandrovna is a rare woman. Varvara Adalionovna, my daughter, the rarest of daughters. Circumstances compel us to let out rooms, an unheard of degradation. Me, who could have been a governor general. You, we are always glad to see. But there is tragedy in this house, all the same. The prince looked at him inquiringly, his curiosity greatly aroused. There's a marriage in the offing, and no ordinary one. It's a match between a woman of dubious reputation and a young man who might have risen to a position at court. They are bringing that woman into the house where my wife and daughter are living, but over my dead body. I'll lie down on the threshold. She'll have to walk over me. I hardly speak to Ganya these days. In fact, I keep out of his way. I'm giving you advance warning. You're going to live here. You'll witness it all anyway. But you're my friend's son. And I have the right to expect... Prince, be so good as to come into the drawing room. Called Nina Alexandrovna, now appearing in the doorway herself. Just fancy, my dear, exclaimed the general. Nice it seems I used to dandle the prince in my arms. the case so much, and I learned how to junk it up. Nina Alexandrovna glanced reproachfully at the general know, and inquiringly at the like, prince, we don't but didn't start, utter we a word. The prince set off after her. But yeah. no sooner had they seated themselves in the drawing room, and Nina Alexandrovna had begun talking to the prince in a rapid undertone, than the general himself came in. His wife at once stopped talking and bent to her knitting in visible annoyance. 
The general also perhaps observed her vexation.